Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Oakland Church. I, uh, I greet you in Christ's name. I'm Dave. I'm the lead pastor. So glad to have you with us. Got some new faces among us, and we hope you feel welcome in this place. And those who are joining us on the live stream, I just know that you're family and we love you. Uh, we have uh, connect cards in our seats, and you can find this form on our website as well. Gives us an opportunity to get to know you better, pray for you, and we have a little gift we'd like to send you if you'll fill one out. It's been, a, it's been an exciting week for me. I got to spend the last couple days interacting with ministerial candidates, young people and not so young people, I guess they're all probably taller than me, uh, who have heard the call of God. And uh, they just feel like that they need to pursue that call, get prepared to, to, to do vocational ministry. Many of them will probably continue in another career, but uh, it just gave me hope that God is still calling people and people are still listening and in my prayer that, that we would listen to his voice, that we'd, we'd say yes to whatever he asks us to do because he is good and he has a plan for all of us. Hear these words from the 71st Psalm. Uh, the psalmist has had some hard times. None of you can relate with that. Then he says, you restore me to even greater honor and comfort me once again, talking about God. I will praise you with music because you are faithful to your promises, oh my God. I will sing praises to you with the lyre, O holy one of Israel. That's like an electric guitar. I will shout for joy and sing your praises for you have ransomed me. I will tell about your righteous deeds all day long. So God, I, I don't know if we'll do that all day long, but we're here to boast on you, to, uh, to give you honor and glory for what you have done in our lives and what you are going to do, God. Um, if it hasn't been such a great week, God, I, I just know that, that you have good in store for, for us today, God, and may we have open hands and open hearts to receive it. Bless each one who is here and those who are coming and those who are tuning in on the live stream lift their burdens today and encourage their hearts. Help us to know and love you better. We just commit this service to you in the name of Christ. Amen. Amen. All right, well, every time I close my eyes and open them, we, we have more people, so I'll keep doing that. Would you stand and confess with me, Christ has died. Christ is coming again. Hallelujah. Amen. Remain standing as we worship. Yes, let's uh, proclaim together. Lord, whatever you have for me this morning, my answer is yes to you, Jesus. Because I count on one thing, the same God that never fails will not fail.
Amen. Amen. We say yes to you this morning, Lord. Alone in my soul and dead in my sin. Lost with no hope and no place to begin. Your love made a way to let mercy come in. When death was arrested, my life began. Ash was redeemed, only beauty remains. And my open heart was given me. My morning grew quiet, and my feet rose to dance. When death was arrested, my life began. Sing of his grace this morning. Oh, your grace so free washes over me. You have made me new now. Life begins with you. And it's your endless love pouring Chains. I'm a prisoner no more. My shame was a ransom he faithfully bore. He canceled my debt and he called me his friend. When death was arrested, my life began. Oh, your grace so free washes over. Thank you, Jesus, for what you do for us every day and the grace that you bestow upon us. Even yet, as we continue to fall short of your glory, Lord, you call us to your purpose 
And so we say, yes, I will, Lord. Yes, I will go. I will do as you wish. We take a moment in our service uh, each week to just allow a space to praise the Lord through our prayers, uh, as well as bring him, uh, bring him our cares and concerns. Uh, he does not ignore those. He said, bring what you have to me, and I'm going to take it and help you bear those burdens and, and celebrate with you in the, in the good times as well. It's not just about, you know, commiserating with the Lord. Uh, it's celebrating in spite of the circumstance we're in. God, I need you. I need more of you today. So would you pour yourself out? Because I can't do this by myself. So I'm going to invite you this morning to come. If you have a need that you want to lay at his feet or maybe just offer some words of adoration to our Father this morning. We open the altars at this time. Pastor's going to lead us, but let's sing that chorus one more time. Oh, your grace so free while she's over me. You have made me new now life free. your endless love pouring down on us. You have made us new now life begins with you. It begins with you. You may be seen. God, we thank you for this opportunity to worship as we pray. It brings you glory, God, when we uh, acknowledge our need for you, our dependence upon you. But that's not all that this is about, God. We believe that you hear our prayers and you go into action on behalf of, of your children, God. Uh, we long to see your hand move in our families, in our health, in our relationships, in our finances, God. So help us to be honest before you, Lord. These have come acknowledging their need, and there are many of us, many others here today who would say, God, I, I need help. So help us, Lord. Give grace and wisdom and guidance and courage and peace and hope. Lord, throughout this ministry center and in every home, may your spirit be ministering, combating the lies of the enemy who tries to convince us that you don't care, that maybe we're too far gone. Speak truth to us in these moments and in this service today, God. We want this hour to make a difference in our lives. God, we, uh, we thank you for uh, your help in the past week. Um, you've been with our people, Lord, continuing to touch Elaine as she recovers from her surgery. Thank you for being with the Congdon son-in-law, Chris, Lord, and, and we pray that the doctors will figure out what's wrong with him and Get him on a better path, Lord. He's acknowledged he, he needs to make some changes, God, and give him the determination and discipline to do so. Thank you for seeing Rich through his heart procedure, God. Continue to keep him strong as he awaits uh, another surgery. And we lift Tori to you, Pastor Tori, God. Uh, you'll encourage him, um, keep him moving in the right direction as he approaches another surgery. Lord, we're kind of praying he won't need it, but whatever it takes to restore health to his, his shoulder, his body, um, just may he feel your presence in these moments and our love, Lord, sustain Emily as she cares for him, God. And thank you for those volunteers who stepped up and the teens who are probably doing as much giving now as they are receiving. Just bless them, Lord. Bless each one. 
God, we thank you for being with uh, True and Kira as they've dealt with COVID. Just continue to con- completely heal their bodies, Lord, and, and there are others succumbing to this virus. Just uh, help them to get the right treatment, Lord. I, I think of our neighbors today. Bring an end to this plague, we pray, and the fear that accompanies it, God. And use it to remind us that we need you. Lord, prepare us for our missions weekend, fast approaching. Get our missionary, our dear friend Milton Gay here safely and just give him the strength for all that uh, we're asking him to do and you're asking him to do. And use him, God, to uh, show us how we can partner with you in the greatest mission the world has ever known. Lord, may our hearts be open. May we be generous with our resources because you have blessed us with so much. May we invest in things that last. God bless Brooke Heaton today and Joy Richter on their mission fields. May they be experiencing um, breakthroughs, Lord, meet their needs. Pray for uh, our African friend, David Cole Craddy, who is working with a mission back in Liberia, God, that needs resources and your help, Lord. People who have so little and show us how we can help and help us with the mission field all around us, God. There are people who we can bless and point toward you where we live and go to school, Lord. May we represent Jesus well. May we live as people who have been changed, who have been set free by the marvelous grace of God so that the world will know that you're real. Thank you for this time and for hearing our prayers. Now give us ears to hear what you have to say. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. My great privileges as pastor, as pastor, one of the things I most enjoy, um, you can leave that there, as uh, I assist in the dedication of a child to the Lord. Stephen and Amanda are bringing their just little bitty baby boy, Caleb, uh, to offer him in dedication to the Lord. I invite them to come this time. And the, the daughters are coming, and Stephen's parents are in town. Oh, I, whole family is welcome to, to join us on the platform. Come on up here. You said you have some hand sanitizer for me. Okay. All right. Hit me up. Thank you, Steve. And then people brought little children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them and pray for them. But the disciples rebuked them. Jesus said, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. In presenting this child for dedication, you signify not only your faith in the Christian religion, 
but also your desire that he may early know and follow the will of God, may live and die a Christian, and come on to everlasting blessedness. In order to attain this holy end, it will be your duty as parents to teach him early the fear of the Lord, to watch over his education that he be not led astray, to direct his youthful mind to the holy scriptures and his feet to the sanctuary, to restrain him from evil associates and habits and as much as in you lies, to bring him up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Will you endeavor to do so by the help of God? If so, answer, I will. Amen. So I ask uh, you grandparents and sisters and congregation, will you commit yourselves as the body of Christ to support and encourage these parents as they endeavor to fulfill their responsibilities to this child and do all you can to assist um, little Caleb in nurturing his growth towards spiritual maturity? If so, answer, we will. Amen. All right. Oh, it's just a wee little one. Let's pray. Gracious God, um, we marvel at your handiwork, the miracle of life. Um, this truly is one of your best gifts to us. We thank you for the safe arrival of Caleb and for giving Amanda strength and just being with him as he struggled with some early health issues, God. And we're praying that you'll protect him, Lord, and bless him. We want him, we want him to have a great life. We want him to accomplish much. But most of all, we want him to love Jesus. So we dedicate Caleb Hudson Nguyen-Schwander to you in the name of the Father and Son and the Holy Spirit. God, may his heart be tender to your voice and your call, God. And may Stephen and Amanda and Claire and Addison um, model Jesus to him. And may we be faithful to pray for this family, God. And just anticipate that day when he will understand his need for a Savior and we'll say yes to Jesus. Again, give uh, the family all the strength and patience and wisdom that's needed. And may these be joyful days. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Thank you. Can, can I take him for a little walk? Or No? Okay. All right. I'll just hold him here. You, you like to see him. So uh, let's, uh, oh, man. Let's, let's sing together. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak as he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me. Can I give him to Dad? All right, well, here's the certificate, and you may congratulate these parents and this family. God bless you guys. You can return your seats. Well, I, I want to introduce you to uh, another life, a little hairier. This is Sage, our grand puppy. Five-month-old golden doodle. He's a good dog. But not all dogs are. Like this guy. <laughs> and this. <laughs> I 
and this one. <laughs> Although, if you're not a cat fan, maybe this is a good dog. If you are a cat fan, you won't like this one. <laughs> And this one wasn't caught in the act, but uh, he was busted. None the same. True, we'll appreciate this. I climbed into the U UPS truck and peed on the packages. <clears throat> and Tracy got a picture of Tom Darlin's dog. I wish he was here. Is that Chewy? And what, in the remains of a stuffed elephant? But... You know, if Tom were here, he'd say, no, Chewy's a good dog. And, and we'd say that about all those dogs. Those are kind of endearing moments and, you know, they're really good dogs, right? But this one isn't. I, uh, I showed that picture to Tracy and she, like, rustled. That's your worst nightmare, having a, well, maybe not your worst, but a bad nightmare, having a ferocious dog bearing down on your children or, or grandchildren. A dog like that can, can cause, cause damage. Bad dogs can steal, kill, and destroy. So we're going to look at some bad dogs this morning. In Philippians chapter 3, I invite you to turn there if you have a Bible. A text will be on the screen, but it's good to bring the, the Word of God. We have some in the back for the, the borrowing or the, for the taking. And I invite you to stand for the reading of the Word. Apostle Paul, the Apostle Paul's letter to the Philippian congregation, the church in Philippi. Being in, beginning with verse 2. Watch out for those dogs, those people who do evil, those mutilators who say you must be circumcised to be saved. For we who worship by the Spirit of God are the ones who are truly circumcised. We rely on what Christ Jesus has done for us. We put no confidence in human effort, though I could have confidence in my own effort if anyone could. Indeed, if others have reason for confidence in their own efforts, I have even more. I was circumcised when I was eight days old. I am a pure-blooded citizen of Israel and a member of the tribe of Benjamin, a real Hebrew, if there ever was one. I was a member of the Pharisees who demanded the strictest obedience to the Jewish law. I was so zealous that I harshly persecuted the church. And as for righteousness, I obeyed the law without fault. He's talking about the law of Moses, the, the Old Testament scriptures. I once thought these things were valuable, but now I consider them worthless because, because of what Christ has done. Yes, everything else is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have discarded everything else, counting it all as garbage that I could gain Christ and become one with him. I no longer count on my own righteousness through obeying the law. Rather, I become righteous through faith in Christ. For God's way of making us right with himself depends on faith. I want to know Christ and experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. I want to suffer with him, sharing in his death, so that one way or another I will experience the resurrection from the dead. I don't mean to say that I have already achieved these things or that I have already reached perfection, but I press on to possess that perfection for which Christ Jesus first possessed me. No, dear brothers and sisters, I have not achieved it, but I focus on this one thing, forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling us. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. So we're going to talk about some bad dogs today, <laughs> that, or at least hinted at in, in these words. And the end is that we would hate, we don't like to hate anything, but hate bad theology, bad beliefs, erroneous things, things that can harm us or even destroy us, and that we would love Jesus more. So the first bad dog 
is universalism. Teens, you know what universalism is? It's, it's the belief that we all make it in the end. Everyone is a child of God. And, you know, we've all been made in the image of God, but, but having that status as children of God isn't universal. Maybe more importantly, universalism contends that, you know, everyone makes it to heaven. They, they go to that better place when they die. And I wish it were true. Don't you? I mean, then I wouldn't... Uh, lose so many hours awake at night worrying about my family and friends and, and some of you. If it all ends well for everyone, you know, life would be easier and happier. But we don't, we don't find that in this book. Um, you know, it's funny because people like the heaven part, but they ignore everything else, and it's pretty clear what this book says it speaks of a God who really is holy and perfect and unlike any human. And because of that, because he is God, because he is holy without sin and, and perfect, in, in all ways, sin can have no part with him, can't be near him. Otherwise, he wouldn't be God. That's what Paul says in in Romans, you know, he, he can't just look the other way and be God. He can't ignore sin. So he did something about it. That's why he sent Jesus, right? Because he, he doesn't want anyone to perish. Second Peter 3, 9, he wants everyone to be saved, but it won't happen unless... Something changes unless he takes drastic action. Paul says, I become righteous, right with God, through faith in Christ. Maybe Jesus says it best. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Then no one can come to the Father. No one can bridge the gap that exists between them and God because of their sin without Jesus Christ. It's one of the scarier dogs out there and, and one that people really believe in, that in the end, we all make it, we're all okay. But that's not what the Bible says. If I, uh, if I had to pick a, a dog to represent that, <laughs> and probably only those my age and older will remember this guy, I'd pick Spuds McKenzie. The original party animal. Because that's kind of the attitude. Like life is just about having fun and it all ends well. And, but it's not true. For the next bad dog, I pick this guy. They always, they always look so sad. And it is sad. Bad dog number two is is the belief that I'm a, a hopeless cause. I've sinned too badly or too often to be forgiven. I've met people who believe that, and, and maybe some of you have just kind of written yourself off, or you, you just can't live for Jesus, so you've accepted your fate. But how can anyone accept the possibility of eternal separation from God? Hell is no party, I promise you that. But the good news is no one has to go there. But there's still some who, who think, yeah, I, I've, I've crossed that line. I've, I'm too far gone to be saved, to be rescued. Well, have you ever um, hunted down and murdered anyone? Any, anyone admit to that? And even if you have, that doesn't disqualify you. The Apostle Paul, the author of this letter and so many others, the greatest Christian missionary of all time, before he met Jesus, was doing that. He was hunting down and, and executing or, 
or encouraging the execution of Christians. That's his story we read in the book of Acts. It's, it's unthinkable. How could you stoop any lower? But not even Paul was disqualified. God loved him and invaded his world on that day on the road to Damascus. He saw Jesus. He, he realized his desperate need for salvation it's hope for the Apostle Paul. So isn't there hope for everyone? I mean, I've heard. It's, it's shocking. It's, it's scandalous of serial killers, Jeffrey Dahmer, coming to faith in Jesus Christ, former Nazi concentration camp guards coming to faith in Jesus Christ. which means there's hope for adulterers and addicts, even those who struggle with porn. Can't seem to rise above that. You've just given up. There's hope for cheats, liars, thieves. There's hope for those who've surpassed the 70 times 7 that you know Jesus talks about in Matthew 18, like... God never runs out of forgiveness. Those who ask, for those who humble themselves, for those who turn to him. Everyone, everyone who believes and receives Jesus places their whole trust in Jesus Christ, what he did on the cross. Everyone can be saved. And, and that's where it starts. He, he invites us, dripping with our sin, to come to him and place our trust in him. And, and then the miracle happens. He begins to remake us. He, he makes all things new. And it, you know, as we talked about, will take a lifetime. He takes us just as we are. He doesn't leave us that way. All right. <laughs> Forgot what was next. Okay. So you're tracking with me? It's a lie from the enemy that there's no hope for me or for, for this person. No one is beyond the grip of God's grace. All right. The next dog, I, I picked a border collie who's always, you know, working hard and getting pats on the back. Nothing like a border collie to represent. Maybe the main dog that the Apostle Paul's dealing with and confronting called works righteousness. And his challenge was a little different. The, the religious people who were, you know, coming behind him to his churches, who people who had placed their trust in Christ and saying, well, Jesus is good. But you got to do this and this and this and this. Circumcision, obey the law of Moses faithfully, and then God will like you. Then you can become his child. But I think the problem today, even among good people like us, is we think we can be good enough. As long as my good outweighs my bad, I'm golden. So I help people, I give some money, and, and trust that that'll be good enough when I stand before God. He'll, he'll see my long list of good deeds, and he'll say, all right, you're one of the good ones, so come on in. But did you know, apart from the persecuting Christians thing, <laughs> The Apostle Paul was a good dude, right? And even that, he, he was doing in a perverse way to please God. I won't get into that. But just look at, you know, his pedigree. He, he came from the good, a good family, the right tribe, Benjamin. He was a, a Hebrew of Hebrews. He, he did good things. He studied God's word. He taught God's word. He probably gave money away. No one was 
better than the Apostle Paul. But he wasn't good enough. That's what he says. He, he couldn't bridge that gap. He, he couldn't earn favor with God. Earn heaven. No one can. We put no confidence in human effort. As, you know, merit, as enough to make us right with God. It says it more famously in Hebrews or Ephesians chapter 2. It is by grace that we are saved through faith. This is not of yourselves, not by works or good deeds, so that no one can boast. There's no place for saying, I'm a good boy, you know. I've figured it out. I'm, I'm a holy man because I've disciplined my life. I, I spend enough time reading the Bible and praying, and I give enough money, and I'm one of God's favorites. <laughs> no one can make that boast. I think we get that, but do we get that? I remember, I mean, I'd been pastoring for a few years back in Missouri and Christian most of my life. When that reality just broke in and, and you know, wrecked me, realizing that, that nothing I had done, no, you know, I hadn't sinned so much nor ever could, that God wouldn't save me. And I couldn't be so good. I couldn't do enough things that God had to save me. It was Jesus who took my sin upon himself. He was and is my only hope. And when I stand before God on that day, all he's going to care about, I think, is did I trust Christ? Did I rely wholeheartedly on what he did on the cross? Did I believe that he was enough for me? And I do. It's grace. The greatest gift in all history. The only gift that, that lasts forever. And when we get grace, I don't think boasting is a concern. I, and I don't think living well you know, trying to live a life pleasing to God is, is hard. It's like I was lost, and, and God did this unthinkable thing. Jesus paid this price. Here's my life. It's not much, but do with it what you will. I mean, it's just the, the logical, the automatic response. We offer our lives, our, the life Jesus has purchased back to him, and he, he'll do something with it. I don't think we get that because there's a lot of Christians who look kind of like this. <laughs> it's the, the last dog we're going to talk about, I find, in, in this passage. It's the I'm good to go dog. I've prayed the prayer and I believe in the prayer. You know, I have sinned, I'm sorry, I trust Jesus, come into my life, make me new. I've been baptized, I believe in baptism, I'm, I'm dying for a few more of our people to sign up so we can dunk in the tank, and it's a powerful sacrament that can change us, but you can't just say, yeah, I've been there, done that, I got my fire insurance, which is a horrible way to view it. Not going to hell. Took care of that, so leave me alone. 
You know, I got a life to live. I got things to accomplish. I got people to impress. I got possessions to accumulate. There's probably nothing inherently wrong with some of that stuff. But let's look at the Apostle Paul. Now, he was made new through the, the work of Jesus on the cross. He, he got it. He was a child of God, but he was not content, complacent. You know, he wasn't like, yeah, I, I took care of that. Now, what do I want to do not, next? What's, what's, what's next on the agenda? This was his attitude. He pressed on to know Jesus better. I, I've not arrived. I have so far to go. I, I, I'm going to spend the rest of my life getting to know Jesus better, learning to love him and honor him and make him famous. I want to know Christ. Christ was enough for Paul. Jesus had saved him taken away the sin, did for him what he could never do for himself. Jesus had sustained him in those dark moments when he was imprisoned, when he was experiencing hardships and disappointments. Jesus was there carrying him. Jesus satisfied him. He says a chapter later, I I'm content. Whether I got stuff, whether I have nothing, it's okay because I have Christ and he is enough for me. And everything else is what? Rubbish. Dung. Keeping with the metaphor, doggy doo doo. <laughs> That's what he says. All my accomplishments. Everything I thought was important before, it, it, it doesn't matter. At least in comparison to knowing Christ. I believe him, don't you? I mean, <laughs> do I feel that way? Is Jesus enough for me? I believe he can be disappointed at times in how much I need the Hawkeyes to win <laughs> or need you to like my sweater vests. <laughs> and I just see how caught up I can be in lesser things. But what I want most of all is to know Christ. Uh oh, it froze on me. Let's see if you can animate that for me. The last couple blanks. The more we know Jesus, what? The more we'll love him, right? That's why we come. That's why we're in journey groups. We need to know Jesus better because the more we know him, he, he starts to fill those empty spaces in our redeemed lives. He, he, we learn that he's enough for us and we don't need popularity or, or possessions or someone to love in this lifetime. I mean, he may give us those great gifts, but we don't need them. Christ is enough. I really want to know Christ. Amen. Let's pray. God, I thank you for this message that you gave to me that I needed to hear as much as anyone. It's humbling. Been at this a long time. I, I know the way it works, but Some days I forget, I lose sight of you and what you've done and your great love, Lord. And uh, 
<laughs> and you again call me back to my first love, my eternal love, God. There, there's one love that lasts forever. So like Paul, all I can say, I, I'm not there yet, but, but Jesus, you are my obsession, God. And, and that's what you want from all of us, not just those paid to say this, God. And I think in coming days when maybe some things are stripped away, we're going to be, need to be clinging to you. We're going to need to understand that we lose everything but have Jesus. We still have all that we need. So I thank you for reminding us and drawing near to us, God. And if you need to do something in us today, help us to say yes to you. Christ is my reward and all of my devotion and there's nothing in this world I could ever satisfy through every trial my soul will see no turning back I've been set free Christ is enough for me Christ is enough for me everything I need is in you there was a moment this past week that uh, my friends and I had a crucial conversation. I don't know if you've ever had one of those where it's like <clears throat> you're maybe talking about sports or, you know, the happenings of the day. And all of a sudden it kind of takes a left turn. And uh, for us, it did. It was over uh, chat. We were texting and <clears throat> we were just kind of talking about success and the idea of success. And one of my friends kind of wrote down, yeah, for me, it's, you know, friends and family. Uh, my kids, it was number one, my kids, friends and family and my work. And, uh, you know, and then it, it kind of dove into, well, why do I feel so empty? When am I still not happy? Um, I'm like, yeah, some of it's like how you define success, um, you know, enables a lot of that. And I was able to share you know, for me, um, loving, caring, and sharing those around me, trying to make their lives better is kind of how I measure success in my life. Uh, I'd shared with them that, like, I look around in moments of weakness, I look around at others that are kind of my coworkers that came in at the same time I did, and they've maybe been elevated in their positions at work. And I wonder, well, what am I missing? I mean, do they have something I don't, or what? what's going on? Why? Why haven't I climbed the corporate ladder, that type of thing, if I admit in moments of weakness? Um, but I said, I made a decision not to let those things define who I am and define success for me. And he asked, well, well, does that work for you? Are you satisfied with that? You know, do you feel, you know, complete? And I'm like, I do, and I'll tell you why. Because I, I can't control a lot of those other things, the conditions that have to exist for me to climb the corporate ladder or, probably out of my control, the vast majority of them. The things like my attitude and my heart and my caring, those are things that, you know, you can kind of control. But here's the thing, I can't do it alone. I can't do it by myself. Those things kind of tend to run out. And that's where my relationship with Christ comes in. It gives me strength, right? And so I think another bad dog that I thought of is one of misinformation, the world telling us, well, this is what success looks like. You know, for them in the scripture, it said, you have to be circumcised to be saved. And he's like, no, that's, that's not, that's bad messaging if you believe in that. So, um, I don't know, I wanted to share that. The good news is, I think the Lord is bringing those type of conversations into my life. I hope he is yours as well, as you engage with those around you, uh, meaningful conversations. But it helped me realize 
what's most important to me. And that is um, my relationship with Christ as that's growing. So I'm going to sing this chorus one more time. And maybe you need uh, a fresh touch today. I don't, I don't know. Um, but we're just going to allow space for the Spirit to move uh, together. Why don't we stand real quickly? Let's, let's sing this chorus together. And then Mackenzie's going to bring us a word about exciting and upcoming times in the next couple of weeks. And Christ is enough for me. Christ. I have decided to follow Jesus, no turning back, no turning back. I have decided to follow Jesus, no turning back, no turning back. The cross before me. The world behind me, no turning back, no turning back. The cross before me, the world behind me, no turning back, no turning back. That chorus one more time. Christ is enough for me. Christ is enough for me, and everything I need is in you. You're everything I need. Amen. You may be seated. Mackenzie, I'll turn it over to you to close out the service. Well, good morning, everybody. <laughs> you know, after a message like that, it, it is encouraging to think about people who are serving Jesus all over the world, right? And kind of the connection that we can feel to them when we think, you know, things are hard, you know, they've had it harder and just like how have, you know, how do all of us stay committed to Christ? So um, we get to celebrate that in a few days here. So I was going to ask, do people know what's happening in six days? What is it? <laughs> it's the Family Missions Weekend. Um, so we are going to be kicking off with our Saturday event in just six days from now. It's going to be 3 to 5 p.m. And I wanted to show you guys the lineup of what our volunteering activities are going to be. I know what we talked about doing these micro-volunteering activities that we can make an impact across our community. Here is the full list. So there's going to be something for everybody. Um, it's perfect for all ages. Come as a journey group, come as a family, come as yourself, um, and you're bound to find something that will be of interest to you. So you can certainly pick a station and stay there for those full two hours or, you know, maybe spend 20 minutes at a few different ones to kind of get a sense of um, all the things we have. But we're excited to be able to make a local impact um, on Saturday. So I wanted to show you guys, you know, what should I bring, which is our next slide here. Um, I put some dollars because we're going to have a taco truck there on Saturday. It'll be there that whole time. Um, Oakland is buying down the prices so you can get tacos for a dollar, street corn for a dollar. So it's a great way to get a meal for the whole family. So make sure you bring some cash for a taco truck. Um, bring some diapers. You guys probably saw out in the link. We've been collecting those. We've got a few boxes out there now. Um, if you've got a sewing machine and would like to bring it for the sewing station, bring it. Um, there's a new station that just got added where we're going to be doing some yard work for the church, clearing out the ditch in the back there. So bring some gloves and maybe some long pants if you'd like to participate in that 
and then bring some love. <laughs> so as you guys know, Missions Weekend is all about supporting our, our missionaries in the World Evangelism Fund, and Jackie did a great job last week talking about that and what that means. So we will be collecting pledges um, Sunday that will kind of set up your giving for the year to support Nazarene missions around the world. This is what the pledge card is going to look like. So just be thinking this week and praying and talking with your family, you know, about what you might want to give to support that ongoing work. And I think, I think that's it. We'll be excited to see you guys, okay? So six days from now, three to five on Saturday, it's going to be right here in the parking lot in the ministry center, and we're excited to see you. I'm excited. Milton Gay is one of the coolest people you'll ever meet. Uh, so glad you joined us today. I hope you've been blessed. I just want to remind you that if, you know, if something happens in this service that you, you, you need help processing, journey groups are a great place, but you can call me, um, set up an appointment. If you're ready to place your trust in Christ, if you're interested in baptism, I'd love to meet with you and, and help you understand about that. As always, we, uh, we welcome your gifts here throughout the week. There are four ways to support the ongoing ministries of this church. Most of you know what they are, but, but continue to trust God with, with your tithe. And we're going to journey groups now. Uh, we'll keep talking about these because this is what we're going to be doing. We feel like it's how we will grow in love toward God and each other. So um, if you're not sure where to go or what to do, you can hang out with me. I'll be meeting with uh, a journey group over here to kind of process what we've heard, to go deeper um, it's, gonna, it's, been, it's been good. So once you stand, let me bless you as you go. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Go in peace.